As long as businesses existed, there's been organized crime in one form or another. It's, it's hard to argue that prohibition helped to develop and fine tune organized crime into what would become known as the mafia. It has also helped to romanticize the notion of a collection of charismatic businessmen who operated outside of the law to provide a service and a product that people wanted. It also developed another belief that the police and the government were the bad guys, always trying to spoil everyone's good time. It all starts with Block 16 and 17. When William Clark was preparing to auction off the Las Vegas town site in 1905, he sectioned the land into blocks. When the town began to draw the city map in 1906, Block 16 and 17 were established as the only places to legally sell liquor and offer gambling. This designation quickly made them the clear choice for all manner of illegal activity, including prostitution, gambling, after it was made illegal in Nevada in 1909, and alcohol when it became illegal in the 20s. Yeah, Block 16 became the most infamous of these two parcels. Today, it's located behind and across the street from Binion's between 1st and 2nd and Ogden and Stewart Avenue. While officials did not approve of the activities going on at Block 16, they did very little to stop it. Violations were so flagrant that it was said that prohibition only made it slightly more difficult for Block 16 to do business because they had to sell alcohol in secret. Now, the most notorious saloon in Vegas was the Arizona Club, known as the Queen of Block 16 and famous for its slow gin fizz. The Arizona Club originally opened as a tent saloon in 1905. By 1906, it was remodeled into the two-story property that it's most commonly remembered as. At the Arizona Club, you could get all manner of illegal vice all in one stop. The second story was most commonly remembered for its brothel. Yeah, the property was so popular that within two years, the Arizona Club expanded again, adding a third floor. The design of the building's frontage became so iconic that in 1942, after the property closed, it was moved to the Last Frontier Casino on the Strip and was used until the late 50s. The Arizona Club was also the first gaming property in Vegas to actively promote itself. Eventually, Nevada re-legalized gambling in 1931, and the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933, but prostitution still continued unchecked. However, in 1941, the U.S. Army built the Air Corps Gunnery School, now known as the Nellis Air Force Base. The Army informed the city's administration that they would make the city of Las Vegas off-limits to all personnel if prostitution continued on Block 16. Nevada had ignored prostitution on Block 16 for so long because it attracted business. Now, since it would prevent it, city officials could no longer ignore the issue. Block 16 was raided on December 2nd, 1941, and 22 women were arrested on prostitution charges. However, most posted bail when the brothels reopened. Raids and releases continued for several weeks until the city decided to revoke the liquor and slot licenses for all saloons on Block 16. Without the steady cash flow of the two, the saloons and brothels all closed up. The Arizona Club closed in 1942, and eventually Block 16 was declared hazardous and demolished. It was later paved over and became parking spots. Today, it's home to Binion's parking garage. The first guy we want to talk about is Tony Cornero. Yeah, Tony wasn't a mafia guy per se. He was more of an independent entrepreneur of illegal activities. He ran in the same circles, but didn't really report to anyone, nor did he step on anyone's toes. During Prohibition, Tony made a lot of money smuggling whiskey from Canada and rum from Mexico and selling them to speakeasies in Southern California. By the time Tony turned 25 in 1927, he had made a million dollars. Yeah, and that million dollars equates to about $12.3 million in 2011 standards. Yeah, Tony eventually got caught and in 1929 spent some time in jail. While in jail, Tony learned that Nevada was about to legalize gambling again. Yeah, Boulder Dam was about to begin construction, and the U.S. government was concerned about the social element, so they informed the city of Boulder that there was to be no gambling and no prostitution. This helped to consolidate both into Las Vegas. When Tony got out of prison in 1931, he got together with his two brothers and came up with a plan. 3.3 miles down the street, on the corner of Fremont and Charleston Boulevard, a parcel of land was available that would locate their club next to the newly paved Boulder Highway. It would also make their casino the first resort the workers would see coming into town from the Boulder Dam project. So Tony purchased 30 acres for a dollar an acre. On April 1st, 1931, the Meadows was licensed to have two craps, two roulette, two blackjack, two poker tables, a big six wheel, and five slot machines. On May 2nd, 1931, the Meadows Club and Casino opened and it brought customers from all over town. 
The property was named after the Spanish translation for Las Vegas, which means the Meadows. The Meadows cost $31,000 to build and had a first-class 30-room hotel and a top-notch casino with a great restaurant and bar. They even built a landing strip to make it easier to bring in movie stars. Many consider the Meadows to be the forerunner of the modern casinos that would be built in the 1940s. Fifteen years before Bugsy was given credit for a carpet joint, Tony Cornero opened the Meadows. Local business and civic leaders referred to the Meadows as America's most luxurious casino. Amenities were advertised as rooms, quote, all with bath, end quote, hot water available at all hours and electric lights. People would get all dressed up and come out for an evening at the Meadows. Tony hired Broadway producer Jack Laughlin for $500 a week to create the Meadows Review, and it sold out nightly. And the booze was top-notch, especially compared to the local liquor being served downtown. The property was doing great, but three years into the Great Depression, things were getting worse and not showing signs of improving. Yeah, the Great Depression started in 1929 and continued to get worse until it peaked in 1934 and 35. After peaking, it would take another five years for the economy to recover. Also in 1931, Prohibition was still in effect and would be for another two years. Prohibition lasted from January 16, 1920, with the 18th Amendment to the Constitution until December 5th of 1933, when the 21st Amendment repealed it. Facing all these problems, two months after the Meadows opened, Tony and his brothers sold the hotel, but continued to run the casino. Yeah, one of the problems they had was keeping the rooms at the hotel full. People who gambled, partied, and drank at the Meadows drove home when they were done. Three months later, a fire burned the hotel to the ground. Now, the fire is believed to be the work of arson. It's also believed that the fire was intended to burn down the casino and not the hotel. Some say the fire was set by the New York Mafia because Cornero refused to give them a cut of the action. Minus a hotel, Tony and his brothers continued to run the casino until early 1932 when they decided to close the meadows and move back to California. This was not the last time Tony Cornero would operate a casino in Las Vegas. The 21st Amendment of the U.S. Constitution put an end to Tony's booze smuggling business in 1933. Despite being the worst parts of the Great Depression, Los Angeles still had many wealthy movie stars and residents with disposable income. L.A. had several gambling clubs at the time, but they were frequently being raided and wealthy patrons didn't want their name in the papers associated with that. Looking for a way around this problem, the idea of the infamous gambling ships was born. Yeah, L.A. authorities' jurisdiction only extended three miles off the California coast. At that point, it was international waters. It's believed that the Chicago mob originally bankrolled the fleet. Johnny Roselli was their point man. He worked with Jack Dragna, who was considered at the head of the L.A. Mafia at the time, just to keep relationships friendly between the two organizations. Tony Cornero was welcomed in as another partner and a respected entrepreneur in the mob community. As early as 1936, the SS Monte Carlo, SS Tango, and SS Texas set up shop 3.1 miles off the California coast. For 25 cents, a water taxi would pick you up from Santa Monica Harbor, and in 10 to 30 minutes, you'd be on a luxury cruise to nowhere. In the beginning, it's estimated that these gambling ships made as much as 100,000 to 200,000 per month. Yeah, an interesting side story. In 1937, the SS Monte Carlo was anchored three miles off the shore of San Diego. During a storm on New Year's Day, the ship broke free from its anchor and drifted to the shore, eventually landing on the beach. Despite the value of the gambling ship at the time, no one claimed ownership because once on shore, the gambling ship was illegal. What is left of the SS Monte Carlo is still there today, on shore of the El Camino Towers of the Coronado Shores condos. The ship is usually underwater, but it can be seen during low tide. It's actually speculated that $150,000 worth of silver dollars may still be in the slot machines today. Once the New York Mafia learned how lucrative the gambling ship operation was in California, they wanted a piece of it too. Meyer Lansky decided to send Bugsy Siegel to L.A. to expand their racing wire service as well as get a piece of the gambling action. Yeah, this is the reason Bugsy was in California in the first place when the Flamingo opportunity presented itself. Tony and Bugsy quickly developed a working relationship, and Tony was more than happy to expand the business with New York backing him. In 1938, the SS Rex, the most famous gambling ship, was added to the fleet. Yeah, the SS Rex opened on May 5th. It was billed as the world's largest, most luxurious casino. The cost invested in the SS Rex isn't clear, but reports are between $250,000 and $600,000. 
From the outside, it didn't look like much. However, it could accommodate 2,000 gamblers, carried a crew of 350, including waitstaff, chefs, a full orchestra, a squad of gunmen, and a dining room that served first-class French cuisine. It was estimated that the SS Rex made $300,000 a night after expenses. However, with Bugsy in town, trouble began to brew. Bugsy wasn't liked by either Jack Dragna or Johnny Roselli, and neither were big fans of New York coming in and taking a piece of the action. Blaming Tony for bringing Bugsy and New York into their operation, Jack Dragna put a hit out on Tony. Before that order could be carried out, all of the casino ships had bigger problems to deal with. Attorney General of California Earl Warren pledged to shut down the gambling boats. Warren and the state of California figured out a way to change the way the three-mile limit was measured. They moved the starting point to the coastline. This means the ships were now in California waters and illegal. Warren, the LAPD, and the Coast Guard made their way to the gambling ships intending to shut them down and arrest those in attendance. However, Tony wouldn't allow any of the cops on the ship. Not wanting to get into a gunfight, Tony ordered his crew to use high-powered water hoses to keep Warren and the police from boarding the ship. This went on for three days. Eventually, Cornero surrendered, but not without taking a shot at the authorities. Yeah, Tony claimed that he only surrendered because he needed a haircut, and the only thing he didn't have on that ship was a barber. <laughs> <laughs> Police brought photographers with them to capture pictures of officers taking axes to roulette wheels and throwing craps tables overboard. After the Coast Guard seized the wrecks, Tony decided to operate a legitimate shipping company from 1939 to 1944. But in 1944, Tony was ready to return to Vegas. He approached his friend Orlando Silvangi, who owned and built the Apache Hotel on Fremont Street. The Apache Hotel was the nicest hotel in Las Vegas from the time it opened in 1936 through around 1945. It was the first building to have an elevator in town and the first to have a fully carpeted lobby. It became the place people went to make deals. In fact, both Howard Hughes and Kirk Krikorian were known to take lunch meetings at the Apache Hotel. Orlando and Tony struck a deal for Tony to take over the Apache Casino just for clarification, some records say at this time that the casino was also known as the Western Casino. Now, Tony, when he took over, renamed it the SS Rex. However, Tony had trouble getting a gambling license. Yeah, first, he was denied by the gaming board, well aware of the issues Tony had in California, as well as questionable fire at the Meadows property. Then, surprisingly, one of the council members changed their vote and gave Tony a license, only to pull it from him again. The Vegas SS Rex only lasted about 21 weeks before Tony had to abandon the idea, and a new tenant took over and renamed it the El Dorado. Today, it's part of Binion's. Tony went back to California and tried gambling ships again, this time off the coast of Long Beach. He named his new ship the Lux. The game of being arrested and found innocent resumed until Congress passed a bill in 1948 outlawing gambling in U.S. coastal waters. Tony's next venture would be as a consultant to the Mexican government, helping them develop their own casinos. However, the boys in Vegas didn't like that much and paid him a visit. When Tony opened the door of his home, he was shot in the stomach with a shotgun. He was in the hospital in serious condition for several weeks before recovering. It was during that recovery that Tony started to dream up and develop his next idea. Tony returned to Las Vegas one more time with a plan to build the largest casino and hotel in Las Vegas, the Stardust. But that's a story for another time. The next guy we want to talk about is Guy McAfee. Now, Guy McAfee is credited as being the man who nicknamed Highway 91 The Strip, a callback to his time on Sunset Strip in Hollywood. Long before that, he was a Los Angeles vice squad captain. He joined the purity squad that took aim at alcohol, gambling, and prostitution. He also took advantage of all the bribes thrown his way to prevent businesses from being busted. Eventually, McAfee decided to just go into business for himself and began operating his own clubs on the Sunset Strip, offering all manner of illegal recreation, specifically gambling, alcohol, and prostitution. In 1931, he ran the Clover Club on the Sunset Strip in L.A. It's believed that Mickey Cohen and Bugsy Siegel were also investors in the club. The Clover Club was a members-only establishment for the rich and famous and was outfitted with reversible gambling tables in case of raids. Even though the club was frequently raided, none of the L.A. stars were ever caught up in the busts. In 1931, Time magazine referred to McAfee as the Capone of L.A. As politicians and authorities ramped up their efforts to shut down all of the illegal night spots, from time to time the Clover Club would close after gambling raids. Occasionally they would lose their liquor license, but every time they got shut down, they would usually reopen about a month later. 
The game went on for quite some time, all the while making McAfee a very rich man. In 1938, new mayor Fletcher Bowron pledged to rid Sunset Strip of all illegal vice with the help of the FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. In 1939, McAfee relocated to Las Vegas. Many rumors surround why McAfee left L.A. and moved to Las Vegas. One story says that L.A. mob kingpin Jack Dragna chased all of the independent illegal businesses out of town. Another says the new mayor of L.A. made it too much of a hassle for McAfee and his businesses to remain profitable. McAfee claims that he moved because he wanted to operate a gambling operation in a place where it was legal. The fact that McAfee made a point to state to the press, quote, I'm not saying the Balron administration made it too hot for me, unquote, makes the story that he was chased out of L.A. by the mayor the most likely reason for the move. In 1939, Guy purchased the Paradise Club for $20,000 and turned it into the 91 Club, named after its location on Highway 91. The 91 Club picked up where Guy left off at the Clover Club, entertaining high-end clientele. Yeah, the Paradise Club was the first club casino built on what would become the Strip. However, it wasn't the first establishment to be issued a gaming license after it was legalized in 1931. That honor went to another nightclub on Highway 91. The Red Rooster was the first licensed casino on the Strip. It's not really fair to call either of these establishments casinos because they were a little more than nightclubs with a few slot machines. Both clubs were closed for their illegal alcohol sales, but the Red Rooster was actually raided by federal agents. Over the years, the Paradise was the more successful of the two clubs. At some point, both establishments either sold the land they were located on to future strip resort investors or were incorporated into larger resort properties. In 1940, McAfee decided to concentrate his efforts on Fremont Street. First, he opened the Frontier Club and remodeled the property next door into a South Seas theme and named it the Mandalay Lounge Nightclub. In 1941, he sold the 91 Club to R.E. Griffith, who built the last Frontier Hotel and Casino around it. On Fremont Street, he helped to open the Pioneer Club in 1945. He also took over the SS Rex Casino connected to the Apache Hotel after some trouble with Tony Cornero's gambling license and reopened it as the El Dorado. McAfee used his connections with Hollywood stars to get them to come to Vegas and stay at his properties. In 1945, he purchased a coffee shop, pool hall, and the old Boulder drugstore on the corner of First and Fremont Street. He put $250,000 into renovating and decorating the place in a 19th century Barbary Coast era San Francisco. 1946, he opened the Golden Nugget with the largest casino in Las Vegas at the time. In 1949, McAfee built a 100 foot tall neon sign and proclaimed the Golden Nugget as the brightest night spot in the world. In 1951, McAfee and his partners, including Belden Cadelman, bought the last frontier for $5.5 million. The property was renamed the Frontier. Over the next decade, McAfee had financial stakes in many Las Vegas properties until his death in 1960 at the age of 71. By all accounts, Bugsy and the New York Mafia outfits is the first instance of the Mafia, or organized crime, coming into Vegas and owning a property. But that wasn't the plan. Yeah, Bugsy had actually been getting into a lot of trouble back east. His lack of discretion regarding mob business was drawing a lot of unwanted attention to the syndicate. Legend has it that Bugsy was getting restless with being second in command and wasn't prepared to do what it usually took to become number one, specifically kill his childhood friend Meyer Lansky. Many considered Meyer to be the top guy running the syndicate after Lucky Luciano was deported to Italy. To give Bugsy something to do as well as to get him out of the syndicate's hair, Meyer tasked Bugsy with expanding the syndicate's wire service to the West Coast. In the late 1930s, only Western Union was legally allowed to wire race results. Wires not only provided the results of a race, but reported information like track conditions, jockey changes, scratches, and anything that could affect the outcome to bookmakers across the country. This was problematic because the results of things like photo finishes and jockey objections could take a few minutes to get to the bookmakers. Savvy cheaters could take advantage of this by getting the results faster than the wire could get to the bookmakers. Then placing bets knowing what the outcome of the race before bookmakers got the official results and closed betting. To get the information as fast as possible, you needed to subscribe to an illegal wire service. In the 1940s, two major nationwide wire services operated. Continental Wire Service, operated by Chicago mob man James Reagan, and Transamerica Wire, owned by the syndicate in New York. While expanding the wire in California, Bugsy began investing in the gambling ships. Bugsy developed a partnership with freelance hoodlum Tony Cornero and financed the grandest of all gambling ships, the SS Rex. 
Yeah, it isn't clear whether Bugsy did this on his own or if he was acting on behalf of the syndicate. Either way, this rubbed a lot of people in Chicago and the LA mobs the wrong way. The popular sentiment was New York had no place coming into what they worked to set up. With Bugsy involved, competition stopped being friendly. Boats were set on fire and owners were found washed up on the shore of Santa Monica Beach. Once again, Bugsy was drawing too much attention to himself and by proxy the syndicate. While in California, it was also Bugsy's job to check in on the syndicate's operations in Vegas. While expanding the wire in Vegas, the syndicate acquired stakes in several casinos, including the El Cortez, the Frontier, and Golden Nugget, but the most infamous was their role in the Flamingo. The syndicate's investment in the construction of the Flamingo is the first time that organized crime was the primary financier of a Las Vegas casino resort. However, it would become a common theme over the next 15 to 20 years. It isn't clear when, but at some point, the various factions of the Mafia around the country realized the potential of Vegas. They also realized how they could ruin that potential if they allowed their squabbles and infighting to spill into violence in Las Vegas. Hoping to avoid the problems, bruised egos, and feelings of intrusion that they had had with the gambling ships in California, as well as a few other cases, it was decided that Vegas would be an open city. This meant that anyone could set up shop in Vegas without needing anyone's permission. It was also made clear that there was to be no killing in Vegas. If people didn't feel safe, they wouldn't come to stay and gamble. This loophole would be exploited by many criminals on the run from the mob. All they had to do was get to Vegas and never leave, and they would be safe. The Havana conferences were a collection of meetings of the various families of the mafia across the country to discuss large matters affecting everyone. These meetings were where the decision to kill Bugsy Siegel was made. More than likely, this is where the mob declared Vegas open. By 1950, the Mafia already had a presence on the Strip. New York and Meyer Lansky controlled the Flamingo and the Thunderbird, and Cleveland and Modelitz had the Desert Inn. But the Strip only had six properties at this point. Over the next decade, that number would double, then triple in the next 17 years. One situation can clearly be pointed to as the catalyst for the massive influx of Mafia presence in Las Vegas, the Kefauver hearings. In 1950-51, to 51, Senator Estes Kefauver accepted the position of Chairman of the Organized Crimes in Interstate Commerce Committee. Initially, the committee's job was to combat any type of organized crime that spilled over state boundaries, things like drug trafficking, kidnapping, and pornography. However, Estes had something else in mind. Even though he could have gone after the wire service and the bookmaking that actually crossed state lines, Estes wanted to use the committee to make himself a presidential candidate. So he went after something sexier, casinos, specifically illegal casinos in the various cities across America. This would be the actual focus of that committee. The committee also set out to prove that an Italian Sicilian organization controlled a vast organized crime syndicate. In the end, the committee uncovered that lots of people of all nationalities, ethnicities, and religions operated various forms of organized crime all over the country. It is also popularized that the idea that organized crime was a product of immigrants new to the country. The Kefauver hearings, as they would become known as, started in May of 1950 and lasted 15 months. Hearings were held in 14 different cities and had more than 600 witnesses give testimony. An interesting factoid, despite having all of the same problems as every city investigated, Senator Kefauver's home state of Tennessee was never investigated. The Kefauver hearings were the first time that congressional hearings were televised. They were watched by an estimated 20 to 30 million Americans, either at home, for those who had TVs, in movie theaters, bars, restaurants, and businesses. The number of TV sets in New York City area doubled during the 15 months the hearings took place. It was said that people adjusted themselves to Kefauver's schedule. Dishes stood in sinks, babies went unfed, businesses sagged, and department stores emptied while the hearings were on. Time Magazine put Estes on the cover portrayed as a national hero crusading to free Americans from the evils of organized crime and their gambling operations, even though those activities had been operating illegally and completely out in the open for the past 20 years. Most people had never seen real mobsters, and seeing them on TV captured the public's imagination just like movie mobsters do. Television also demonstrated how charismatic gangsters could be. Alleged mobsters constantly plead the fifth, danced around questions, and even made wisecracks about the situation to the committee's questions. For example, Frank Costello, who was referred to as the Prime Minister of Organized Crime in America, was questioned multiple times every day the committee was in New York. Every day he answered the committee's questions the same way. On the advice of counsel, I declined the answer on grounds that it may incriminate me. 
In five days, Frank Costello used his Fifth Amendment right 138 times. On the sixth day of questioning by the committee, Frank had had enough and informed the senator that this was a waste of time and walked out. His actions caused him to be in contempt of the U.S. Senate and was sentenced to 18 months in jail. After the Kefauver hearings, the word mafia became the most popular way to refer to organized crime. The committee's final report was more than 11,000 pages long, but only four of them pertained to Las Vegas. One thing that was uncovered was the relationship between politicians, authorities, and mobsters wasn't as clear-cut as it should have been. For decades, some of the biggest donors to political campaigns were mobsters. The biggest legislative effect the committee's work had was in influencing Congress to create the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, better known as the RICO Act. It allowed everyone affiliated with crime, no matter how small their involvement, to be tried for it. Simply put, if a mafia boss instructed someone to kill another person or commit any crime, if one person was caught, everyone that could be connected to it, including the boss who only instructed the job to be done, could be tried just as if they all pulled the trigger. In 1952, Estes ran for president but lost his party's nomination to Adelaide Stevenson. He tried again in 1956 and was again defeated by Adelaide, but this time he was elected the Democratic Party's vice presidential candidate. However, the ticket eventually lost to Eisenhower and Nixon. While the hearings didn't make Estes president, they did pressure cities across the country to get non-licensed casinos closed up across America. It also got J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, to admit that a national organized crime syndicate did exist and that the FBI did little about it. Previous to this, the FBI denied it even existed. No longer able to get law enforcement and city council members to look the other way, Organized crime around the country found running gambling operations in their hometowns too risky. One by one, they closed up shop and moved to Las Vegas, where they didn't have to worry about getting busted for doing the exact same things they did so well in their hometowns until the Kefauver hearings. In Las Vegas, a criminal in Detroit would be considered a legitimate businessman in Nevada. In fact, in the beginning, Nevada refused to extradite people accused of the crime of running a casino in another state because it wasn't illegal in, in Nevada. This was the case with Benny Binion. History considers the Key Fiver Committee probably the most important probe of organized crime in U.S. history. Now, technically, we should go over Benny Binion at this point. Mm -hmm. He moved from Dallas to Vegas and opened the Horseshoe in 1951. However, Benny's story is a little too complex for this feature, so we just wanted to acknowledge that this is the point in the story where Benny should be included because he was involved in organized crime and moved from Dallas to Vegas because of the crackdown on illegal gambling operations. However, he'll have his own Vintage Vegas segment. Now, the mob found multiple ways to attach themselves to Vegas casinos. They would build them. The mafia would bankroll the construction of a project in exchange for a silent partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some cases it was from the ground up, but in others, casino owners wanted to expand. Since banks wouldn't give money to casinos at this time, the Mafia and eventually the Teamsters Union would be the only option. This was the case with the Flamingo, as well as how Mo Daletz became involved in Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn. Another way the Mafia would enter the market would be to rescue a property in financial trouble. Maybe a, an owner over, overextended themselves, construction costs became too high, or the casino had a bad run and needed a cash infusion. This was the case with Milton Prell and the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird had a terrible grand opening, and Milton didn't have enough money to pay out all of the gambling winnings they suffered. Meyer Lansky saved the property from having to close with cash to cover the debts in exchange for a silent partnership. Finally, some casinos were for sale for all the reasons people sell businesses, so they would buy them. In all these cases, a frontman was required who could get or was already licensed to run the legitimate front of the operation. These people tended to have little to no say in how the property was run. So if it's legal to own and operate a casino in Nevada, the state didn't judge owners on their past transgressions, at least at first, and the mafia didn't allow killing in Vegas, what was the problem with having organized crime in town? The skim. The skimming is the practice of removing money from the casino prior to it officially being entered into the books as revenue. You don't have to pay taxes on money that didn't exist. This is how silent partners were paid out without a paper trail. The Mafia skimmed millions of dollars from Las Vegas casinos before they were run out of town with the help of Bobby Kennedy, Howard Hughes, E. Perry Thomas, Las Vegas Metro, and a change in corporate and public opinion regarding gambling as a legitimate form of business. 
While it's probably true that the Mafia had its hands in some form or another in every Vegas property, what we do know is that the first 18 properties built on the Las Vegas Strip, 17 of them at one time or another were primarily controlled by various Mafia families from cities all over the U.S. The Mafia's presence in Las Vegas wouldn't be completely removed until the mid 1980s with the murder of Tony Spilatro and a near-death experience inspired Frank Lefty Rosenthal to retire, the exploits of which are well told in the movie Casino. The Mafia's time in Vegas has been romanticized for so long that facts and fiction are often hard to distinguish. While there is a tremendous amount of information about the Mafia's time in Las Vegas, Details are hard to find and almost impossible to verify. Now that we have given you an overview of the subject, in future features we'll be able to focus on the specific properties and people behind them. Yeah.